Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We're here in the UAE and uh, we're trying to do a little vlog here. We're rolling with uh, Ras Zahabi and some of the UFC fighters and we're here in the masjid. So I'll update you on what's happening, inshallah. It's a beautiful architecture here. Hamza. What do you want to say to the camera? You are a beautiful architecture. That's right, I mean, he speak the truth. You're right, sir. How's it? How are you finding it? How are you finding I'm the amazed. mission in architecture? I'm really amazed. Mm. Unbelievably amazing. Mm. Beautiful, incredible. How about you, Nuruddin? Yeah. You're a sea fighter. Yeah. <laughs> how are you finding it? He humbled me a lot, this place. Is, uh, it's nice, it's huh? amazing, yeah, the finest. Beautiful. I am Fadi Kamen Love. A lot of love for Faraz in this uh, UFC community. Mashallah, mashallah, mashallah. So, what, what's, what's going on with the GSP? He's going to call out now. He's going to call out now. We're like, it's going to be a video right now. GSP! We are offended. I got a message for it. <laughs> We what's what's you haven't called us out yet. <laughs> Why? What's wrong with us? Uh, no, I'm, I'm slipping, man. I'm slipping. <laughs> <laughs> this is Canadian wrestling is very different than American wrestling. Much more uh, intense. Polar bears, you don't have polar bears in Canada. In America, you guys wrestle grizzly bears. Much smaller, more delicate, more fragile. In Canada, we have the polar bear to wrestle with. But you guys don't make it into the Olympics. You don't do well in the Olympics that well, do you? That's not real fighting. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but, no, but you guys do. Like, yeah, Gia's good. I, I used to look up to the... Yeah, this is the UFC room. Assalamu <laughs> alaikum. <laughs> How's it going? How's it going, Aki? You alright? Very good. Okay, so here's my variation of Abyssinia's Hanging Man. Okay. When you were born, we told you your name is Muhammad Hijab, Hamza, Mabzin. We tell you what your name is, yeah? We, it's, it's conditioned. It could have been something else, yeah? When you were born, you, you, you learn about the dunya. You learn about the dunya. You, okay, you, you see something cold for the first time. You see something, uh, something big, something small, something rough, something smooth. You're learning all about the dunya through the senses, yeah? However, there was a point in time when you were alive where you didn't know about your identity and you hadn't interacted with the dunya yet. This is the exit. There was a point in time where there was no identity, no self, no ego, and there was no interaction with the dunya at all. Even when you were just just born, there's a minimal interaction with the dunya that you're not even aware of. This state of there's no name, there's no artificial experience, there's no uh, sensory experience with the dunya. This is a state of la ilaha illallah. Why? Because all there is is an awareness. Within this awareness, everything is contained. Your whole existence is contained. Your identity, the dunya. That's why, for instance, when we ask materialist philosophers to show us proof of materialism, something outside this self-awareness, they cannot. Logically speaking, they cannot. They always start with the premise that, okay, your brain is material, therefore, if you puncture the brain, the consciousness is gone. But they started with, the brain is material. I'm asking him to prove materialism, and his premise starts with having to accept materialism to prove materialism. But put that aside for now. The mm -hmm. argument of materialism, dualism, and idealism, substance, let's put that aside for now. There was a state of a human being where there's nothing but awareness. This is the state of la ilaha illallah, and this is why Hazari says, the Prophet told us, we're all born Muslim, and then your parents change you to something else. Yeah. So it's I had to yeah. condition you to make you believe a certain person is God or not. Absolutely. I had to condition you, but what is your fitrah? What was your natural religion? What were you born in? So. This is what some of the ulama talk about, yeah? So, uh, what the there's no way out of here, sorry, sorry. There's no way out of here, right? Yeah, the guy told me to go down, and he thought I was coming in. 
Yeah, if you guys out. thought that this man was all about MMA and he doesn't think deep, <laughs> <laughs> see, there's, there's a stereotype with coaches and, yeah. and fighters, isn't it? That they don't think, think anything I, about. I do have a degree in philosophy. That's for sure. <laughs> so you're talking about randomness. Okay, so listen, Hazali, what he's trying to say is Hamza, you were talking about justified true belief. Yeah? Yes. Even justified true belief doesn't eliminate all doubt. Now we have to remember we're not talking about pragmatism here. Knowledge that's useful for putting a roof over your head. We're talking about absolute truth. We're talking about, are you curious about, some people are not interested in truth. Some people are just interested about what puts a f food in their belly and a shelter over their head. After that, they don't want to talk anymore. So if this, this topic doesn't interest you, change the channel. Because people, you know, they're always asking me, okay, well, how do you make money with this idea? This is not about making money. Mm -hmm. It's not about pragmatism. Sometimes people say, oh, I love truth, I love truth, you know, uh, uh, people can't handle the truth, we believe in this truth, truth, they're always talking about truth. What do you mean by truth? Oftentimes what they mean is pragmatism. What yeah. they love is the dunya, what they love is, hey, do these methods and beliefs bring me resources? Do they, work really... or, do they work or not? Exactly. Mm. But because something works, and we can find many examples of things, people believe things that worked, but they actually weren't true, now they've been debunked. Like for instance, we used to believe bloodletting works. Galen believed bloodletting, if he let blood out, he would help you survive. It's actually untrue, completely false. Mm -hmm. But my point being is this, they believed it was true, so they, they believed it was true, they thought it was working, so they called it the truth. To them, it was a, it was a resource. Even things that actually really do work in the, in, in the world, later on we find out the reason why they worked was completely different than the original uh, reason why. So what are we talking about here? There, if you're truly a lover of knowledge, you're going to crank up the dial of skepticism. Now today, the lowest level of skepticism we can accept is the scientific method. You have a hypothesis, we have to test it, it has to be predictive, it has to be falsifiable, etc. But David Hume, Ghazali, uh, Immanuel Kant, this was not enough for them. They went even further. They wanted to know what's the, what's the truth in the ultimate sense. So if you were reading their writings, you're talking about a whole different subject here. So this is, this is what we're talking about now. What is actually true cannot be denied. There's no new evidence in the future. There's no new uh, argument that's going to come. It's bulletproof. Ghazali boiled it down to this point of awareness. A Canadian guy coming to, to Dubai to look at, to take photos. Take photos of this. Take photos of what? Snow. Snow, yeah. Artif is it artificial? Is it actually real? It's artificial snow. This is what they do in Dubai. <laughs> so, for us, how are you having a little cheat meal there? You are. No sugar, no carbs, no fat. Yeah? <laughs> Keto, You actually lose calories when you eat it. I invented it this morning. Oh, yeah? Did you give the recipe to the Cheesecake Factory? I died with the recipe. Salam alaikum. So go and tell us, tell us what your son said. Well, I was I was talking with my kids in the car. Was when we drive when we drive to the gym, they're gonna find this weird. But we do silence, no talking, no music, nothing, no iPads, just reflection. So we do it on a regular basis. We go to the gym almost every single day. So one day my son, my my eight year old son, he's actually seven at the time. He's like, Papa, you interrupted the silence. He's like yeah, I'm like yeah. He's like, I want to ask you something. He's like, I want to tell you something. I'm like yeah. He says, everything happened because of something else. He's telling me, you know, past events led to this event. And then he told me... And your son is like eight years old, eight yeah? Eight years old, but he was speaking really deeply about, you know... That's what happens when you have a philosopher as a father, is it? And then he said to me, and everything's going to be okay. And I was like, well, what would it? I, I can tell you, he has this innate sense, like, everything's okay. Everything is okay. Everything's going to be okay. I was really amazed because you know what? They haven't had the time to be influenced by their environment as much as us or indoctrinated or schooled in a school of thought. These are just as natural thoughts surfacing. It's incredible. Mm. So that's the importance of reflection, yeah? Yeah, absolutely. You discover yourself a lot. Like when you sit in silence, sit in silence for a prolonged period of time. Some people cannot stand silence. The reason why people cannot withstand silence is because I believe it, it's a, it's a deep-seated fear of death. All your anxieties come from your fear of death. It's the last taboo. 
your fear of death, you're constantly distracting yourself with coffee, a movie. If, you, if I sit you in a room with no entertainment, no danger, no danger, but no entertainment, some people will become mad. They're going to live their own personal hell in that room. And some people are going to find peace. It depends how your mind is. But people who are constantly trying to distract themselves, they're running from a particular hell. Quiet, quietude, silence, when being with yourself is insufferable, insufferable. You can't stand yourself. There are some people, they cannot have peace. Some people, they call them intrinsic. They can't stop talking and making noise and it's a non-stop concert. Those people, in my opinion, are uncomfortable with themselves and the idea of death. Because the second, the second things are calm, you're gonna start having deep thoughts. When you have deep thoughts, one philosopher put it best. He said, "Don't think, deep, don't do philosophy if you don't want to see yourself. You look at yourself because you're gonna see some type of ugliness, and you're gonna to have to deal with it." That's why some people they're so preoccupied. They never want to have these kind of uh, intrinsic experiences, internal experience, because they cannot stand themselves. This is the truth. If you look at all the sages, the prophets, the wise men, they all had times of seclusion. The prophet in the cave, they said, Jesus in the wilderness, Buddha under the tree. There was always a period of time of intense solitude. That's uh, deep, man. Introspection. Tesla, Isaac Newton, even even every every single culture, there was a time where there was profound solitude. When Isaac Newton wrote the Three Laws of Motion, he was hiding from the plague. When Descartes wrote the, his meditations, he spent he was in, in isolation. He spent alone in the cabin. They were all running from the plague, disease. And the Ghazali, when he wrote his Ihya, yeah, he was he, he, he went away for ten years. That's what I'm saying. Solitude, solitude is a very special thing. I did leg of lamb. I thought this guy was a vegetarian. Let's talk about leg of lamb. What does Boti mean? I don't know. You've it's, you've it's got the man here. You got the you got the translator here. This is a mixed platter and comes with rice or no rice? No, it's only okay. Which is the best rice? This one. Mexican. Oh, has this has this is one So this is one meal. Can't make a mistake. Can't lie. And it's that it's when you take when we take ourselves as an authority. And then we claim it by God. But you're the authority. You're not divine. That was the whole... Uh, so they say, oh, the community is enough. Okay, khalas, then the community, our community is enough too. We're at the same, we're at the same playing field. And then the irony is, so just for the benefits of the tape, so when we're talking about the criteria for canonicity, which is that the priests come together and they want to canonize the Bible. They want an authoritative text. The main criteria is that it's going to be the revelation or the text or the canon of the Bible if it agrees with our teaching. But the whole point of, can of canonization is that they have to find a text to, uh, to derive evidence for their beliefs, values, etc. So you see the secular As argument. As to say, what's authentic? That's the This is how they reply sometimes. Oh, but the Holy Spirit was working. The Holy Spirit was working. They say the Holy Spirit was working. Then I have another argument. Okay, where do you get the idea and the concept of the Holy Spirit from? The Bible. Then you're back into that mission cycle. So this is this is the end of our trip in Abu Dhabi. We had some strategic meetings. We did some important things. We saw some important people. So this is it. Um, we've had some really interesting conversations for us. How do you feel you went? No, 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 to be fair, not not many people can specialise in two areas like that. No, definitely. Yeah. His depth in uh the Ghazali's take on many things was profound as well. Wicked. Really, really wicked. Anyways guys, 